Let's start with that conversation. Let's do this. <laughs> Hello, my name's James Pikeway, and this is Potaholics. It's Doc Talk with Dr. Jenna, which means we're going to be talking about who knows what. <laughs> we, we have a plan. We have a plan, but you, you just never know where the plan is going to go. And, you know, we were, we were already just talking about dogs, gyms, and Florence, your, your little dog. How, how old is Florence now, by the way? So Florence can only be referred to as my baby, James, but she is four. Wow. I'd never, I'd never had a dog before, uh, before Florence. And don't they say that a dog chooses you? Like I, I used to go to the same pet store all the time. So yes, Florence is shop bought. I'm ashamed of it, but it's not on purpose. She's the only ever dog or animal I've ever had that's not a rescue. And I was always in there buying things for my cats. And one day I just saw this dog and I just turned to my husband and I just said, James, we've got to get this dog. And he was like, what? We're not, we're not getting the dog. <laughs> and I was like, there's something about this dog. And I couldn't stop thinking about it. I'd keep going back into the shop to check she hadn't been bought. I'd set, I sent James cards asking him, please, please buy this dog. She's, she's just, I know it, I know it in my heart. She's a member of our family. And we got her, in fact, James says that I went and got her without his permission, which, I mean, it was a bone of contention for quite a while. Uh, now it's he's- Four years accepted. now, does he still bring this up? It's been four years. <laughs> yeah, yes, James. <laughs> and we are both obsessed with her and she's just the best little dog in the world and I adore her. However, just as a side note, don't agree in buying dogs, don't really agree in overbreeding dogs and she's very overbred. And she has health problems as, as a result, but she is my my baby. It's it's amazing just having having pets around, isn't it? I know that we we got a new rescue, and we were talking about it just a minute ago. His name's Brando, and I I think he's got he's got some psychological things because he, you know, he was a great dog that obviously had a great family because he's just so well trained in, you know, for being at home. And then because of COVID or whatever, people lost their jobs. They had to leave him. And he was, I guess, it appears he was left very quickly. And so he transitioned to oh. staying with some guards at a guard shack. And then the guard shack guys, after a couple of weeks, took him to the kennel for a rescue kennel. And he stayed there for a few weeks and then ended up with us. And, you know, it's like, oh, now the poor guy, every time you leave him alone, it's like, are you coming back? <laughs> and, and all he wants to do is be glued up beside you. And he's, he's 44 kgs of love so you know he's standing wow. beside you and he gets what he wants <laughs> the thing is is at the moment you're in lockdown so it's an artificial situation so mm. it's gonna you're gonna end up spending a fortune in doggy daycare believe yeah. me <laughs> well, it, you know he's good we, we close the door to the kitchen and all that but otherwise when we're not around he just kind of lies by the door and he, he so i i think oh. he he lived in a situation where the people who he obviously lived with did leave during the day and they you know he doesn't eat on the furniture he waits to be given his toys so once you give him a toy that's his toy and he's gonna you know he's he's a lab right so depending on what the toy is he's getting inside the toy <laughs> some things don't last very long he uh he, he lets you know very quickly which toys are you know heavy dog chew proof and which aren't and so for instance i bought i thought i was at i was at car four and i saw this great toy with a ball kind of thing on it and i thought what a wonderful toy and i brought it home seven minutes before he destroyed the ball on it and, and then he <laughs> brings it to me you know he brings it to me tail wagging look what i did look what i did and i went yeah that wasn't a good one <laughs> i mean this is totally off the topic of medicine however I will also add to that. I think what's sad is people don't really appreciate the commitment of having a dog. Mm -hmm. We also got, we, we basically took a stray in and, and her name is Mona Fiona and she's a lovely dog. However, when we went to visit her, she was really placid, sedentary. And we thought, you know, great. She's going to be quite, quite a quiet dog. Great to yeah. have around children. Great with our, with our other dog. Now that she's settled in and she's got used to us, she is wild. I mean, absolutely wild, James. Even in the daycare center, they, they used to say how quiet she is. And now she doesn't leave any of the dogs alone. She wants to play. And I think you've got to appreciate it's not just about getting to know the bad sides of the dogs and the good sides, but also just the level of commitment that's required. Yeah. It's effectively like having a child for life, for their I life anyway. I think I've, I've almost created, you got the boys? Are the boys coming in there behind No, you? do you know what it was? It was James just walked through in his towel and I just wondered whether oh, we you realized it. <laughs> we missed it. 
a little Chip and Dale's in the morning. That would have been, that would have really made this. Uh... <laughs> Our, 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 uh, our big Brando there, I've created a monster because we take him, you know, he loves to go out for a walk and, and stuff. And, and so I take him for, a, you know, a nice run in the morning, a good four, five K run. And he's ready for that run every morning. So at seven o'clock or, you know, now it's getting warm. So at six o'clock, you got to be out there doing that. But he's waiting. Like he, he's nudging you. Come on, let's go. I'm re- you know, seven days a week. Come on, let's go. I'm ready to go. Oh. <laughs> That's, that's a really good point. So if we do try and bring it a little bit back to medicine, I have to say, I really do believe in animals as, as helping with loneliness. Mm. I've lived on my own in the past. I lived on my own quite a lot, actually. And what always helped was to have a couple of cats around the house. In fact, in university, they used to call me the crazy cat lady. And I always thought I was going to end up with two teeth and like a goggly eye because I was I always eye. had cats. But it, but it does, it helps and it's, it really makes a, a house feel like a home when you walk and you've got animals walking around. And we were talking about it with Zainab, uh, my friend who's a pediatrician, mm-hmm. about how they, they just help with emotional well-being. And what's really odd, I don't know if I've ever told you the story, James, but we used to have them in a hospice that I worked in because on the day that somebody was about to die, the cat would get, I think I have mentioned it to you because you're nodding, the cat would come and sit on that person's chest and it was a really great indicator and it was it had a hundred percent accuracy so much so the other hospices in the area rolled in cats to see if it would work and i, I don't know the outcome of, of how accurate it was for every cat and we were able to then tell the family members that they needed to come in and you know maybe spend a bit of time with them it was it was a really great heads up something different is happening i think that intuition or this talk of it being yeah. a smell or whatever it is is animals get it and we don't you know you didn't tell me that story but i read a similar thing i was no reading, way yeah and it's identical to what you're talking about so it's in the latest stephen king book the whatever the shining the second shining is called i i can't remember uh whatever the latest one is called so you remember the shining and that's where you know what the, the possessed kind of person you know you see whatever but on the second version it's when the young boy has grown into an adult and he has the shining and he's able to help people when they're they're moving forward but there's a cat that does exactly the same thing you're talking about and he just the cat knows and he sits with the people and then it's sort of the indicator when the cat's leaving that that he needs to be there because he's got to do his job and it's kind of like huh so i've heard that that kind of thing that's really interesting well, there's a lot of things that animals know that we don't. And that's why, you know, we're all different, we're all different species. But I, I always give the example of the fact that my, my dad, whenever he was coming home from school, he always tells me about how his dog would, as soon as the school bus apparently was coming from right down the road, he would, cut the, the dog would get out the house and go and sit at the end of the path. And it's like, how, how would they know? How do they know? And even my dog, I know she knows as soon as we turn the corner, to go to doggy daycare, she knows and she gets excited. And I think how, I don't understand, yeah. but it's incredible really. And we should make use of animals in this way for therapy, keeping people fit and healthy. You've just said you take your dog out, it's encouraging you even more so to go on your, your 5K run on the days you don't even fancy it. Now, James, you gotta go. Well, and, and the worst part is the darn dog wants to run a little bit faster some morning. So like today we were running at quite a clip and uh, it's, it's good actually because it's almost like some interval training because, you know, he needs to stop to go to the washroom and then I got to get out the bags and pick everything up. And so you get a little break and then you start going and then occasionally there's a cat. So he wants to investigate the cat. So that's, uh, you know, I get, I'm getting a little upper body workout as well. So, but I, hey, I want to <laughs> jump back to something else with animals that, that we, we not at all in our notes, but I've been reading about using animals to help with sensing for some disease, kind of like they sniff for drugs. Dogs and things can also help sniff out some diseases that people have because of the way they interact with the body and I guess the sense they create, or I don't know exactly how they do it, but in some cases, apparently there have been some good results. And I thought that's kind of interesting. It really is. It's not something that I personally know about and it's not something that I've ever come in contact with. But I think it's really interesting that we're, it's almost like going back to, I want to say like tribal medicine. It's mm. kind of sometimes we really we use chemicals and we're so quick to try and, and create things. And it's like there's an awful lot that nature 
has that we don't really utilize in medicine. And that would be a, a perfect example, the fact that animals can detect things. Why can cats detect death a bit earlier than, than we can? Something to do with, as I said before, like a smell or a hormone that is released and they're in tune with it and we aren't. So why, why wouldn't we? It's absolutely yeah. fascinating. Yeah. So the pets, the, the, the end story is have one, but be aware that it's going to take, they're there with you forever. And whether it's daycare, whether it's kennels, when you go away, the maintenance, it's, it's nonstop and you don't get a break, but hey, it becomes part of your family. And, and in our case, the two boys have, have moved on for, you know, school and, and jobs and stuff. So this is just a new member of the family that never really gets beyond the age of, you know, 10. <laughs> <laughs> and also, you know, just, just to round that off as well, is that they're really big for using animals in mental health too, mm. really uh, like therapy pets. But as you said, if you're going to offer somebody a pet, just be prepared, be prepared to have the enthusiasm and the, the wallets to pay for it. So yes. expensive. <laughs> Well, just, you know, the, and, and the vet bills, I mean, not that, that I, I don't begrudge that and, and things, but you know, they, they got to go to the doctor too. And you know, an occasional checkup and it's, it, it adds, it, there's not pet health insurance. So at least not in our country there, there isn't here, but I've, I've heard of it in other places, but not here. So, you know, you gotta make sure you got a great vet and, and be prepared for all of the little things, the, the dental work, dental work for dogs, even cats with our cat that we had. Uh, you know, he had to have teeth removed and that's, that's a big job. So yeah, no, I know it was terrible. It was terrible, but he had to do it. But it is, it is sad the way you say that people, they take on this commitment. They don't realize the extent of the commitment and then they leave them. And yeah. I find that, I, I find that really quite heartbreaking because what I hadn't realized prior to having a dog is they're not that dissimilar to humans in many ways. They're very complex animals. Yeah. I'm sure there's an awful lot of animals that we don't know generally, but dogs are very deep. And as you said, you think your dog is, has some emotional scarring. And I'm sure that's true for a lot of them. So, yeah, think. However, as you said, if you are looking at getting fit and healthy, a dog might be the answer. Exactly. And that's where we wanted to go this week is we wanted to talk about, well, you know, heart disease. And it's, it's one of those things that there are so many other things making the news these days that we kind of ignore this silent killer that is constantly around us and you're hanging out at home more and for some folks that means they're smoking a little bit more, they're drinking a little bit more, they're eating a little bit more, all of those things start to go together, they're not exercising as much, so you start mixing all those things together and you prolong it and it keeps going and it keeps building. And if you already had a pre-existing pre condition because you, you've already got, you're carrying a little bit of extra weight, you know, the more weight you carry, the more your, your body has to work to circulate blood and, and oxygen. And you know, your muscles can only work so hard. Try walking 10K and then what do you feel? Your legs feel awful and your, 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 your thighs and your calves. Well, your heart's working all the time. And it, I think people just forget about it because, well, it just does its job and it's not like a leg or an arm. And I, this was a great topic that you said, you know, we need to talk about this again because people really are not thinking about it. It's not, it's not a trendy area of medicine at the moment. And I think back to working on the wards in the UK and I would work in some wards where there were few patients, but it was a really interesting area there was a lot of research going into it and it'd be really well funded we'd have lots of nursing staff it'd be well equipped there was no running around trying to find a cannula everything was there then you go on the general medical wards now you ask any doctor or nurse in the uk about the general medical wards and they are absolutely littered with people having heart attacks general coronary disease people that are at risk of strokes diabetes and it's so, it's not that it's underfunded, but it's not funded appropriately. And it's because it's not an exciting area of medicine. And so many people suffer from it as well. It doesn't attract the same level of external funding or charitable funding. I, I, I don't believe, I don't know the statistics, but from personal experience, it doesn't seem to be the case. And somebody mentioned to me recently and said, it's a shame that heart disease doesn't have the level of social media marketing that COVID has, because mm. had it, because it's the biggest killer worldwide. It's the biggest killer. That's it. Bottom line. 
And, I'm going to add a here, Jen. I'm going to inter interrupt you just for a second, and but I want you to keep going. But I, I just want to add a stat here. And this is a, an old number, and I sent this to, uh, I put this up on our list. So this is for 2016. We're 2020, but 40% of deaths in the UAE are from cardiovascular disease in 2016. And it, it sort of breaks it down and it says, so communicable diseases are, are a whole other area. This is looking at non-communicable diseases and it's saying 40% cardiovascular disease, 12% cancer, 5% chronic respiratory disease, 5% diabetes, 17% other injuries. And then there are, you know, 6% from nutritional things, et cetera. But 40%, just like you said, this is a huge killer. And, and you have to remember that's that's in a population of young that's a young expatriate population obviously there are some locals that stay here till older age but it's not representative of worldwide i'm sure if we look at the american statistics you'll see it's even more exaggerated and in the uk where you have an aging population and people start to suffer from heart disease from from any age actually but you tend to see it around the 50 mark as soon as people start to hit 50 that's when you're thinking okay has this person got some level of heart disease I get that. I mean, it, and when you start looking at it, all of the, the all of those sort of numbers goes. So you get 50, you get the midlife crisis folks who go out and buy the nice sports car or whatever, and maybe they start hitting the gym and, and things. But when I, when I head out to the gym or when I'm out running or doing whatever, I'm not seeing the 50 plus folks. And I'm, I'm you know, okay, look, I'm stereotyping. I'm being general. I'm generalizing. But for the most part, I'm seeing the younger folks, the 30, 40 groups, the 20s, and the 50 plus, I don't know where they are because <laughs> they're not out exercising and their lifestyle is definitely, definitely calls for, you got to keep moving, you got to keep going, you got to keep doing these things, Met metabolism, all this stuff and all these other things, diabetes, as you said, et cetera. And we'll, we'll, we'll go through the list of different things to think about, but it's, it's like, the switch gets turned off and common sense seems to leave. Do you know, it, it's funny because I once wrote a blog about the fact that now exercise has become, again, it's like a trendy thing to do and mm. girls wear their makeup and some have got gym bracelets and, and sometimes it's a little hair, bit about let's the go hair. to the gym. Or, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and, and that's fine, that's great. But I often wonder, is that a bit intimidating for someone that's a bit older, somebody that's a bit larger, somebody that wants to get into exercise? Mm. And my husband often laughs at me because I really like what I'd say are inclusive gyms. So gyms that like open the doors to everybody. There's no judgment. People don't look you up and down. It's about going to work out and you leave. So he calls them muscle gyms. Like I, I like really basic gyms. I'm not a fan not for any other reason than it's just where I feel comfortable, but I'm not as much a fan of these really slick, you know, you know, the gyms, you know, yeah, the yeah. ones and talking I know about. what you're talking and, about. Yeah. And I, I do wonder whether that's something that we all need to work on is to try and encourage people to exercise more, not just say go and exercise, but maybe we need to give them a space to exercise where they feel comfortable. You, you know, the other, the other side of it, when I think about the gyms and I think about people going to work out. And so again, if we're pegging the 50 plus crowd, it's almost like when you go to the gym or if you're going to go and do a yoga workout or something, who are the people who are the trainers? Who are the, the coaches? Who are the people helping you out? So when I think of yoga, in fact, I, we, we do a nice yoga class and there's, we got this great yoga instructor. She's fantastic. And, you know, yesterday we, I, I heard, oh, it was her birthday. And I, I said to my wife, how old was she? And she goes, 30. And I went, wow, that's, you know, she's old, but really young. <laughs> and then I'm going, ah, that's why she can do those stretches. That's why she's able to do all these things. And, and it's, it's pretty rare that I find when I'm doing, say, my yoga stretching workout, we've got this wonderful lady that we've connected to with Zoom through the Zen studio. Her name's Penny. And I'm thinking, she's got to be 50. Like, it, I, I, I'm hoping that she is because if, if I've now pegged her at, at being, being younger than that, I, I'm, I'm really sorry. But she just strikes me as being a little bit older, a little bit more mature. <laughs> I hope she is that age, James. Otherwise I, you're I, no, I got to look it up now. You know what? I, I feel really bad because if she's not. But, but, you know, but she just seems to be a little bit older. And I don't say that in, in look, but in just 
the way she talks about things. Like you just, a 30 year old doesn't talk about talk like that and, and have that kind of disposition on things. So I wonder if part of the challenge we have is getting the 50 plus coaches who have the same kind of knee pain as someone who've got the same issues with their, their grown kids and grandkids, getting them into the gyms to help coach people so that it's the same people coaching the same people. Yeah. So you need to hear my retirement plan, which I was, okay. I, was I want to hear it. About. I'm ready. Yeah. I'm ready. So I actually do have this as a retirement plan. But when I was in, when I was in university, uh, I went down and did uh, a postgrad in, in London and it was affiliated with the hospital because it was, it was medically based and they had this small hospital gym. And so I signed up, I was doing my, at the time I was really going for it with the weightlifting. So I was there with my barbell and I was really, it was a great gym, only small, but inside it was full of patients. It was like a patient gym. So there, there would be such and such with her oxygen hooked on as she's on the bike. Another guy, he just had an operation and maybe he only had like one arm working out. And there was honestly a whole, a whole list of medical conditions you would find in the gym at any one time. You know, you took a snapshot. And I just thought, how wonderful is this? Because everyone needs to work out, but these people really need to work out because they have a level of disease. They're on yeah. the path. It's not going to get better, but they can stop it getting worse. Yeah. So my, my dream, if I make it, if I'm old enough to retire, I, I really wanted to be a personal trainer for people that have got disease or people that are bigger or older, trying to, some, with some form of barrier, trying to get into exercise yeah. And, and you're right, it's a service that, that we need to explore more. You know what? I, I say this over and over again, and I've said this on blogs. I've said this on presentations that I've done. It's online. It's recorded. It's there. You and I are very much alike. Different genders, different ages, the different professions. But I was thinking exactly the same thing the other day, thinking, man, this would actually be kind of fun to get into, you know, to, so to, to keep working, but also to get into a training situation with folks who are in their 80s who just need to, you know, using a chair, using the equipment that they have, whether it's a wheelchair or a walker or, you know, reduced mobility, whatever, but just help them with some stretches that work for them. And I was thinking about this. Uh, one of the things that got me thinking about it was I, I, I've been wrestling with a little bit of hip pain for the longest time. And I was worried that there was something the matter and, until I, you know, went and saw, saw my osteo and he said, it's just muscles. He said, you know, and he's, he's doing all those, those flexing rotation things. Cause he's also concerned, right? And he's thinking, I hope it's not the joint. So he's got his fingers in places. And he said, no, it, it's not your joints. Fine. You know, I, I, it was, you know, but he said the muscles are so tight. So what I started to do, you know, when you see, and this is, you know, when you see the, some of the Indian and Pakistani guys who are sitting on the side of the road, just resting and they're kind of in that squat, I don't know what you call that squat where they're kind of sitting down with, you, you know what I'm talking about? Oh, I know what you mean, James. Yeah. I mean, that's a deep squat. It's a really yeah, deep what, squat. And, and I actually, I was at, I was at Carrefour the other day and there were some, some of the Filipino ladies and I, you'll, you'll get, I'll, I'll pick, I'm not, again, not stereotyping, you're not gender, you know, poking here, but because <laughs> I'm always so, you know, you don't want to be, you don't, it, it, because we live where we are, you don't, there's always this political correctness. I always feel like I got to, make sure that I, you know, I'm not poking at a specific group, but there was a, a lady there also who was sitting in that really deep squat and just, she was putting stuff on the shelves, but, and I was going to walk by about three or four times because I kept forgetting stuff and she was still sitting like that. And I, and it, the first thing that came to mind is you and I, I mean, I don't know about you, but I don't sit in that, that position very often. And, and I know my wife was telling me that she doesn't sit in that position. She actually finds it hard to get her feet down like that. And, but this lady was just sitting there and the guys when, that I often see who are just resting or watching something on their phone, they're just sitting like that comfortably for like a long time, like maybe an hour or even a better one. Yesterday I went down to sat while we got a pair of shoes fixed and it'll all come together. You're going to get this in a second. The guy who's <laughs> fixing the shoes, he's sitting cross-legged with both legs completely down. And I'm looking at this going, I can't even sit cross-legged, let alone like this guy's sitting there doing this. And and it, it just all, as I was looking at what he did, and then I was, as I was looking at these folks in the deep squats, and as I was thinking about my hip, and it goes all the way back to Bassam, when I start sitting like that, so in that deep squat, and, and just staying in that position for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, all the pain goes away. 
And I kind of feel when I'm sitting there, I feel the muscles after about three minutes kind of go, and you can, everything sort of lets go. And, and if I do that several times a day, I don't seem to have any pain at all. And that's when I got sort of was looking at all these people going, I don't think this, this particular group of folks, whether it's culturally inspired, the way they do these natural stretches, you know, it just works. And so where this, you know, to, to help with our fitness and our health, et cetera, leading into older age, all I kept thinking was, man, if you start doing these things when you're young, great. But what about the folks who are 50, 55, 60, if they can start to, to get some element of this, this movement, this position into their daily routine, it can help with those folks who've, got, who've had hip replacements, who are going to have to go over hip replacements and things to just keep the muscles a little bit more supple and, and help get rid of pain. So, hmm. you know, it's, it's funny, James, because as you're saying that, all I can imagine is my poor knees. My knees could not keep me in that squat for too long. And that's, we're talking about the wonders of exercise and how great it is. And you're talking about the wonders of stretching and absolutely. But there's also that side of people that have exercised for so long that they've actually caused harm to their yeah. musculoskeletal structure. So my knees uh, have been prematurely really? arthritic um, because I did so much running. I mean, I just, I just went out in really bad trainers, thinking like end of the high school, university, I would just be on the pavements doing half marathons, like just not thinking anything of it. And I loved it. It was great, but I, I paid the price now for not having appropriate footwear and, and not really looking after myself. It's, it's almost like if you want to exercise, that's great. But we've talked about it before. Just go and check in with your doctor. They might say, are you using some glucosamine tablets to try and keep your joints supple? Have you got correct footwear? You know, it's, it's, uh, you can't just go out and, and exercise without having somebody moderate you and somebody to check your technique. We've talked about the, the terrible injuries that can be sustained through weightlifting and especially now there's the the new again the trend the the exercise trend is to get the barbell over your head and that's great i love it i love olympic weightlifting but that comes with its own problems so you should really to at least get started seek a trainer really i mean I, you used it you've used a trainer before haven't you you've been with um in a fight in dubai yeah, I, I was with Marcus and uh, he was, he was excellent. And he, you know, and, and uh, Carmen over there, she was great. Another, another person that I've, I've used also is Jay Christie. He's here in, in Dubai. What a fan. He's also a fantastic guy. Just really. And it's, it's wonderful having the trainer. I mean, I mean you know this because you use, use, you've used trainers, but it's little things, even if you're just doing a push up. And they'll say, no, no, move your arms a little bit further back. Or if you're doing a squat, no, keep your back a little bit straighter. Or if you're lifting something, lifting was the big one. I was doing some lifts and they're, and they're saying, no, no, hold on. We got to take some weight off. You're, it's just, you know, no, I can do it. Goes, no, no, we're going to take some weight off and you're going to build up a little bit more. But it's just having that person watching the form and saying, no, get your elbows in. It makes yeah. a difference. Which is the, it's the ideal situation, but not everybody can afford it. And that shouldn't be a barrier to, to seeking exercise, there are a million and one online tutorials. So occasionally I might get a weights program through and I think, well, I'm not quite sure how to do this or it doesn't feel quite right. And I will then free on YouTube, Google, right, how do I do an RDL correctly? And, and then I'll, I'll watch over and over and just right, go and correct myself. Like there are ways to do it. And the sad thing is, is as we're talking about this, I hope that we're not deterring people from exercising because we're making it sound complicated. We're saying, go out there, do it safely, be careful, you might get arthritic knees, you might get some hip pain that requires extra stretching. And really, it's like, get out there and do it, but just start gently. I think it's when you get to the extremes that you need to have someone just give you a little helping hand. You, you know, and I want to talk about some of the things that you just brought up, but the helping hand and being realistic. So in my own case of my little achy knee, that's getting uh, knee, my knees are actually not so bad. They're, they're stiff though. And I've noticed this. So, you know, I'm, I'm 54 and in the last year I've noticed that my knees that I mean they work well, they they don't have any pain or anything, but they're stiffer. So, you know, when you go down and you, you bend down on your, they're not, they're not as, as supple as they used to be. They're just stiffer. And I'm kind of going, oh, that's not good. I mean, it's, it, just, I'm going, hold on, 54, uh, knees are getting stiff. Yeah, let's say another 30 years. Oh man, this is not boding well for me at all. I, and I think my, my, 
like you're, like you're saying, Jenna, my message would be, if you feel anything, the smallest niggle, and this is for me with my hip, I should have gone right away and seen my osteo or the physio guy as soon as I started feeling that tightness. Of course I didn't. I waited months. I thought, ah, oh, it'll go away. I'll rent it out. I'll stretch it out. And yeah, none of that worked until I needed to go in and get the, you know, three or four treatments where they're, they're doing crazy, you know, muscle release and stuff and add some, you know, some more stretches. If I'd gone right away, would have been okay. But it's the same thing, isn't it, that we've talked about before in every aspect of healthcare. Prevention is better than cure. So if you mm. go and, and do routine appointments, my advice would be if you, if you like seeing a physio, if you like seeing an osteopath, or even just to your general practitioner, just go and make an appointment. We started talking about heart disease, and it's the same for heart disease, for exercise. I really do believe, and, and Cheryl Wasama, the psychologist, she also mentioned it, I really believe in going to see your doctor to check in for a whole body scan. So yeah. is my heart, am I medically healthy? Am I physically healthy? And, and by physically, I mean musculoskeletally and, and internally in my mind, am I healthy? And it's, there's nothing wrong with going for preventative medical checks. There's just nothing wrong. Just check in. Like you said, you take your car every so many thousand miles, you take it to the, the garage to be checked over. Why don't we do it ourselves? We are a more complex version of a car. I mean, much more complex Then hence, there's more things that can go wrong. Yeah, exactly. Hey, I want to jump back to something you said, and then I want to come back to the, the heart disease stuff. Glucosamine tablets, do you find they work? Things are uh, and I'm stuff. only going on uh, patient's feedback, and I think the ones that take it consistently over a period of time, they do find that it just helps ease mm -hmm. a little bit. And they also report that when they've stopped taking them, that they feel a bit stiffer. Whether that is the placebo effect, I'm not sure, yeah. but uh, we, we do prescribe it in the UK. Um, for people that are suffering really quite badly with arthritis, will you know it's something that we'll certainly recommend or prescribe. So, uh, from from personal perspective, yes, I have had really good feedback from from using glu sorry, glucosamine. I've heard of folks saying of who have done glucosamine stuff that it's it's a long lead up. So once they start taking it, it takes months before you start to feel or, or notice any any effect from it. And I think that that poses a real big challenge for a lot of us because we want that instant. I want to take that pill, kind of like a Panadol. Take the pill, headache goes away. I want to take the pill, <laughs> joints feel better. It's like, nah, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> no, because you've got to, basically trying to build up lubrication in your joints. That, that's how they mm. work. And yeah, that takes time. So uh, one more thing before we get back to heart disease, you, you've got your knee issues. What's your prognosis for yourself you know, over the next 20 years? What are you thinking? Just don't think about it, James. <laughs> I, try, I try not to think about it. <laughs> Otherwise, you get depressed. I, um, basically, I, you know, I, I used to love running, and that yeah. was always my support. But I've moderated the sports that I do. So I do more kickboxing now. I, I, I told you I do weight training, which is really good. People don't think that that would help. Um, issues that you have in your joints but it does because it takes takes the pressure off the joint the muscle does the work rather than the joint doing it so I'm very careful in, in how I exercise I don't don't push it too far I mean I, if I'm doing cardio I, get, I go for it but when I'm uh, doing weights I'm very careful like you said uh, I respect the fact that they can cause injury uh, and I just, I just have to moderate it occasionally I'll try and go out for a little run and it reminds me, every time I go for a run, it reminds me how much I loved it. It was a real mental health thing for me. You put your headphones on, you go, especially in adverse weather conditions, whether it was really sunny, whether it was really dark, whether it was raining, running in the rain was wonderful. If it was a bit of snow coming on the ground, and even better, the best thing is, is hail. Oh, that was just wonderful to run in. Running in hail? <laughs> yeah, it, oh, it's fantastic. And if you went on holiday, you took your trainers and you would you'd find all the best spots here on holiday. It was, mm. it was really always has been my favorite, favorite form of exercise. And it's sadly the one that I probably do the least now. And, that, and that's why I think you just have to, you know, respect the fact that, you know, your body's changing and you've just got to go with the times. Uh, but every time I go above about 40 minutes running, I, I really feel it. I really feel it. So I just don't. Yeah, you know what? That's about I, I stick to about a forty minute routine myself. So, you know, that's about a five K for me and at a, a decent pace. And after about forty minutes and it's funny because I, I was planning to do another marathon. And I said after I did my first marathon, 
I said, yeah, I'm not going to do another one. And then it's like a drug, right? And after about two months, I said, ah, you know, I'm going to, I can, I can do better. I can do it faster and started to ramp up the training cycle again. And as soon as I got over about an hour and 20 minutes running, you know, calves started feeling odd and things. And I just, I was running one day and all of these little things started to come up and I wasn't even doing mega distance. I was only doing about 20 Ks. And uh, I realized, yeah, this is not going to work. <laughs> it's not worth it. <laughs> it's, it's really, really not going to be worth it. And, 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 and sorry, on, James. No, keep going. Oh, I was just going to say, and you don't need to do that to yourself either. You no. know, we are normal people that like to exercise. And I think sometimes it's wonderful. And we've talked about this before. It's wonderful that we have these amazing athletes out there encouraging people to exercise. But I think what you and I say is, look, everyone can exercise. Everyone should just incorporate it into your daily life. And the American Heart Association did come out a number of years ago and say, to keep your heart healthy, you need to get your heart up to the maximal heart rate for 10 minutes a day. That's, that's all, mm-hmm. 10 minutes. So yeah, hit workouts are, are perfect for that sort of thing. Really get your heart rate right up. If you're going to do steady pace, then yeah, you need a bit longer. But to really get your heart rate right up and just keep it up as much as you can for 10 minutes, that's absolutely ideal. And there's, nobody's got any excuse for that. And I think the lockdown has been the perfect time for us to remember that and to realize, actually, we don't need to go to the gym. We don't need... Um, you know, we don't need all this fancy equipment. We can keep our heart and our bodies healthy by just little snippets here and there. I, I want to jump right back into this because you, you've, you've opened the door with the American Heart Association. But when we start talking heart disease, and this is, this is kind of a crazy thing because we use the word heart disease a lot and we hear it all the time. I'm pretty convinced people generally have no idea what heart disease actually is. And because of that, that's why we don't see more mitigation being done. We don't see people doing more things because the term is just, well, we've heard it over and over again, heart attack, heart disease. We lump them all together. Diabetes, heart disease, we lump it together. And we, we kind of sit there going, I don't know what to do. It's going to hit me. It's, it's going to hit me eventually. I'm just going to let, I'm just going to leave it all to chance, which is, I mean, as you've experienced it with folks who have, have started developing some of these you know, some signs and symptoms when we were talking with Cheryl and she was talking about panic attacks, mimicking some of the heart disease things when people have those. And I thought, we just have no idea. So can, why did, can you, can you jump in and, and sort of give us the thumbnail sketch of what heart disease is? Yeah, I'll try and keep it simple because normally when I do teach people about this, I have slides and I have pictograms <laughs> to kind of explain it, which makes it a lot easier. But effectively, heart disease is basically the same thing as a stroke, but it's the heart, not the brain. So what the problem is... Well, stroke is, that we stroke have, is brain. Stroke is with your head. Stroke is brain. Stroke. Heart disease is obviously heart. Yeah. But I'll, uh, I'll explain, explain both of them. But all your blood vessels running around your body build up a plaque inside, and that is caused from smoking, obesity, diabetes that's uncontrolled, and high blood pressure all builds up this big plaque. And what happens is eventually that plaque gets so big that it actually blocks off one of the blood, the smaller blood vessels in the heart. I got a question. Go on, yeah. So put it, I'm putting you on pause. You, we're, plaque, that's where we're at. When you were doing your, your medical training, did you, did you have to do some work with cadavers? Yes, yeah, yeah. Did, when you were working with the cadavers and when you were looking at the heart and blood vessels, did you see this plaque inside things? It'd be, it'd be too small, like be tiny. Okay. I mean, it, as, it wouldn't be too small, but it would be, it'd be very small. And in fact, okay. Tallulah, the lady that, that we, we had, my first lady uh, before Reginald, uh, I named them obviously, um, she died of a heart attack at 88. Wow. So, so you didn't see the plaque. Okay, back to your plaque. I'm just, I was just curious if it's like a big white, kind of like you think you're, t- well, it's kind of like teeth, right? You, never, you don't see the plaque on your teeth. You feel it, you taste it, but you don't see it. Okay. Did, you yellow? Did you like a yellow? It's, it's fat. It's basically, it's like a fatty substance. But when it, when it blocks one of the vessels, so the oxygen, which is in your blood, can't get to, the, to a part of the heart. So mm. all your blood obviously carries all the oxygen, but if you're stopping it in one of the small vessels of the heart, part of the heart can't get oxygen it can't get nutrients and if it's left long enough it dies 
and, and that is the process of um, a heart attack. Angina is when the narrowing is getting, it, it's becoming smaller, so the amount of blood that gets through isn't very much. And then sometimes if you're running or you're walking upstairs, the heart needs more blood, so it needs more oxygen. And, uh, and therefore, because this narrowing is so tiny, it's not getting as much as it needs and it starts to hurt. So that's angina. So it's not a complete blockage. It's just a sm it's, it's smaller and it's getting to the point that it's going to be a problem. It's going to start causing a heart attack. So people that don't get treatment for heart attacks actually can get death of part of the heart, which is why you need to act quickly wow. and get to hospital. And the same process is for a stroke. There are two types of stroke, but for what we call an ischemic stroke, an ischemia just means not enough oxygen. That, that it's the same process. One of the blood vessels is blocked in the brain. And if you don't act quick enough, you can get death of part of the brain. So when we, you, you talked about un, uncontrolled diabetes, you've talked about this plaque buildup. What, what, I mean, how, how do we, how do we, is this inevitably going to happen to everyone at some point that all of I mean, the, the disease generally is inevitable eventually so it's kind of like saying we don't really count a first degree relative having cancer for instance over the age of 80 as, as a huge risk risk factor for their child for instance because while well, they're over 80 and these things just start to happen eventually so heart disease is a process that is kind of a caring because it, it you know it, it happens we get older and everything starts to, you know, to show signs of, of, of weakness as we get older. The real big thing is we need to delay it as much as possible. So it's about, it's nothing, nothing radical. And it's why we always talk about it, but it's having a good diet and exercising and not smoking and keeping alcohol in moderation. That is literally the winning formula. The, the only added to that is stress. Uh, stress mm. has does have an impact on the heart there's been more studies out to suggest that stress long-term stress has an impact on the heart puts you more at risk of of what we call cardiac arrest the heart stopping but that is a different process so basically stress and the heart they don't go together very well so what can i do as joe public who's you know in their 50s what should i be doing to determine how far along this path of inevitability I might be. What, what, what do you suggest? So the main thing is to go to the doctors and have a chat with them and they review what medications you're on, look at your blood sugar, look at your heart, look at your uh, blood pressure, uh, look at your family history because there is a genetic predisposition. I always say to people like, look, you're looking at about a percentage, I always say about 50%, but it's probably less, is genetic. So some people will get raised cholesterol in their 30s, even though that, that's unusual and they might be fit and healthy otherwise, but that would be a genetic thing. So you've got this genetic predisposition and then you've got lifestyle modification. So it would be weighing up the two and there are charts and formulas that we use to work out your 10 year risk of a heart attack. I've done it for myself, just Google it online. Um, 10 years. What did you find? What did, what did it say for you? I can't what remember. Did... I think it was less than 1%, I hope. Um, something else, get me James. Uh, but yeah, it's, I think it's less than one percent. But that you know, age is taken into consideration as well. Right. So ideally, to to really assess properly, you would look at somebody's blood pressure, their cholesterol levels, uh, and and have the conversation with the doctor so they can put in other risk factors. Also, if you've had a heart attack or you've had a stroke, that puts you at increased risk because your body's already started with the morphology to to, to be further along the line. So. Uh, what we used to do in the UK, for instance, is when somebody came in and they had a heart attack, we would then give them all this medication to go home with to try and prevent it happening, and that is reactive medicine. But what we want to do now is try and, and get to primary prevention, which is to find out the symptoms that they're having that could be warning signs, and, and, and then start treating from that point. Okay, what are some of these warning signs? Because there's a lot of folks, and I mean, you, you had a, a situation where you were talking with someone who had a lot of these warning signs coming up. They must have had warning signs earlier. What are some of the warning signs I need to be thinking about or our, our listeners, our viewers need to be thinking about as they're trying to assess themselves and, and potential heart disease issues? So the main one is angina. So if, if you're somebody that develops 
pain on exercise around the chest area. And a lot of people get that confused with the fact it has to be left-sided. Oh, I don't have left-sided pain. It's, it's actually central. Well, central chest pain is the earmarked Ooh. pain for, for, for heart attacks. So, so if you have the central chest pain that comes on when you're going up the stairs or when you're exercising, that is a big red flag. That suggests that you have got angina. And usually people will tell a story of it being progressive. So occasionally when I was walking, I would get a central central discomfort and then they'll say actually I've started to get it now when I'm just going up the stairs or I've started to get it at rest and that's when it becomes more and more unstable the second one second big one is breathlessness so okay. as people start to get out of breath so if you find that you're walking on an incline or upstairs and you're starting to get sort of tugging a little bit more than you would normally or for your fitness level then again th those are the, the big the big two really other than that it's just about sort of reviewing your if you if you're somebody that is having headaches suggest that you might have high blood pressure or somebody that is getting a little bit woozy before their their meals could be a sign that they are becoming insulin resistant potentially diabetes but breathlessness okay. and chest pain would be the, the two big markers obesity how does that factor into all this obesity smoking at, at, the, at the two big players james i mean it's uh there's, there's no way around it. You see a population that is obese, you're gonna see a lot more heart disease. And it's, it's a really difficult one because we're kind of got this seesaw, haven't we? Or oh, we've got to be careful. We've talked so much about being really careful that we don't upset people about their weight and people that have got weight issues. And there's definitely a huge population with that. But at the same time, we're also looking at population with rising obesity levels, teenage obesity, childhood obesity. And how do we tell a young 12 year old girl that actually we need to start changing your, your lifestyle because you're suffering with obesity and it's, mm -hmm. you're gonna die prematurely if we don't change this, but yet yeah. not send her off on a spiral to an eating disorder, which can happen. And as a healthcare professional, that's really difficult because especially talking to parents, really difficult. Uh, and in fact, even talking to adults, it's, it's an uncomfortable yeah. issue. Some people are very, very sensitive about it, especially because an awful lot of obesity is driven through emotional eating. So it's, it's a really, really difficult one and has to be dealt with exceptionally sensitively. And, uh, and I don't think the medical population do that very well. I think society in general doesn't do it so well. It, it's actually a funny one. I, and I'll share this one with you because we were, we were fortunately on the beach on the weekend. And so a lot of folks like myself were in our, our Speedos and things. And the number of young guys that I noticed who, who, you know, kind of, they weren't obese, but they definitely had that spare tire starting to form. And I say they were young just because of the people they were hanging around with. So, you know, mid twenties, maybe 30, if they were lucky. And I, there was this one guy and it was it actually was a really interesting situation because I, all I can imagine. So they were, everyone was social distance. So people are kind of spread apart, but the conversation got very, animated in a good way because this guy was there and and he he was clearly some guy who had been bigger because of the way everyone was reacting to him when he took off his shirt and he was yeah I mean I'm looking at this guy going man that guy looks awesome you know I mean it, it caught my attention and it wasn't that you know he was ripped or anything but it was just it, it was it, it was great proportion and and it was there was a comment that got made and again, I, I didn't, you could only get it from the actions, but there was a guy beside him who was more like me, but you know, a little, a little bit of, a little bit of girth on his stomach there. And th this guy said something and the guy who clearly lost the weight said something back. And you know, what the reaction was, yeah, yeah, you know, you can do this too. And this is how you do it. And you can look like this. And, and, it, and it didn't go over well, <laughs> especially when, when everyone especially when everyone else was pointing at the guy who had lost the weight and the guy who could use losing a little weight. Uh, I know it was like, mm. but then they sort of worked it out. And he's, you know, you could see the guy who, and I think it was the reality that the guy who, who knew that he needed to lose a little bit of weight knew it. 
And he just, I, I think it was the motivation. What's the motivation? And, and it looked like the guy who lost it said, you know what, we'll, we're going to work together. I'm going to help you. That's what, that's the, 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 cause they ended up putting their arms around each other. And as you know, there was some head nodding. So I figure that's the way the conversation went. And at least in my mind, I'm imagining it did, but it was, it was interesting. But the opening, the opening line that he gave to the gentleman that needed to lose the weight was a little bit of almost like fat shaming. And I don't yeah, know whether yeah. you've heard this the movement that there is in the medical world at the moment, but there's a lot of people that need to see the doctor for various mm. different reasons. So if you're obese, you're more likely to be diabetic, type 2 diabetes. And I mentioned the statistic to you that if you are a type 2 diabetic whose diabetes is so badly controlled that you then need insulin, your 10 year survival rate is exceptionally, exceptionally low. So, really? it, I mean, I, I want to say less than 10%. I can't remember the statistic, but it's, you, you kind of know on that risk factor we were looking at. And that, that's from death of cardiac disease, not from diabetes. That's cardiac disease because diabetes, cardiac disease go hand in hand. And so these people need to see seek medical attention then everyone should be going every year to see their see their doctor we've talked about that especially in dubai we have the luxury of a private healthcare system and we can go and see and check in over the age of 50 it's absolutely necessary that you should go attend what what we call back at home the well well man well woman clinic which is again mm. once a year just going in having some routine blood tests doing, doing speaking with your doctor finding out if you've got any sort of factors but these people need it more than anybody and they're not seeking medical attention. They're not going to the doctor because they're so embarrassed and yeah. so worried that fat shamed and told, look, why you need to lose weight. And, and you've heard it, you've heard it here, especially, you know, there's cultural differences in the way that we speak in Dubai and everywhere, but more pronounced here. And it's, it's really sad that these people feel that they are mocked or ridiculed or just, just shamed. Uh, where, especially when they're, in an environment that is supposed to be encouraging and supportive. You know, and it's, it's, it's a tough one. It's a really, it's, a, it's like you said, it's that fine line. How do you balance it out? And when you have so many things available to you, when I talk, you know, the restaurants and the takeout and the, it's, it's, what did I say the other day? Three jalapeno chicken burgers from one of our burger joints delivered to your door for 18 dirhams. I mean, I mean, that's, can you, can you hear me now? I mean, that's, I mean, that's crazy. crazy. I, I can hear you saying, you've gone, you've gone, it, it sounds like the aliens are back again. Let's hope that it, 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 it's, it's so much, otherwise, otherwise we'll, we'll call it a day. But this happened, this happened the other day as well. We were doing, doing this, this very, very kind of recording, recording, recording at about this time, time. Into, it. into it. I started, I started sounding like Darth Vader on the other side of the, is that still happening, Jenna? Jenna? <laughs> it's, it sounds like E.T. is here, and E.T. wants to go home, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, that's really because on my side, side you, sound you sound awesome, awesome. And I sound, and I sound like, like, like E.T. E. now, you know, the Darth Vader alien creature. Do you can't hear it at all? No, I, no, I, I, hear I hear you perfectly, you perfectly and it sounds, sounds perfect on my side. My side. Very, very odd. odd. So, so maybe we need to, we need to think about wrapping up our, our podcast. podcast. So, <laughs> so what's, what is, what is, what is, is your message? message? What is your, what is message, your message to folks as we start, start thinking, thinking about, about heart, heart disease? disease? What is your, what is your, your parting, parting words, words on, on this, this scenario, scenario for folks? What do they what need to be doing? doing? What do they need to be thinking? thinking? You know, we've, yeah. we've talked about a few things today and I hope that, as I said before, I hope we've not confused people because what we're saying is, look, everyone, you've got to exercise. You've got to exercise. It doesn't matter how little, how much, to what extent, just start doing something. You've got to. And, and I think what is wonderful about working from home is I do think that the COVID situation has taught us that we are capable of doing it ourselves too. And we, we don't need to have fandangled equipment, etc. However, exercising eating healthy is a winning formula, not smoking, not too much alcohol. But when you do start exercising, don't forget that it might be worth having a chat with somebody that's experienced in exercising just to give you a bit of a helping hand to do things properly and to not incur injury. And anyone, anyone, so especially over the age of 50, but anyone out there should be going to see their doctor, not anyone, but everyone should be going to see their doctor once a year just to check in and have the conversation assess your risk factors, assess if there's anything that you can be doing to, to, to help your situation and to reduce your risk. 
And I'll tell you that apart from medication, which is obviously further down the line for people that, that really need it, number one is always going to be lifestyle and exercise. And there was a quote, I can't remember um, who it was from. It, it wasn't anyone significant anyway, but I read it and I really liked it. And it was just saying how any tablet that you give somebody is never ever going to be as good or have the same effects mentally and physically as exercising and, and, and eating well because that that is the medicine really there we go i gotta say that it, this has got to be one of the best doc talks we've done we, we've we've almost completely stayed on topic Des, how can you say that? We didn't stay on topic at all. We spent the first 15 minutes talking about dogs, <laughs> for which I've got absolutely no qualifications whatsoever. It's all linked together with healthy lifestyle and keeping our minds in, in tune. This is, this is awesome. <laughs> I would honestly, like, the, the, sometimes when we're doing doc talk, I think these poor people have tuned in to hear about medicine and then they've kind of got the whole, whole can of worms. <laughs> I think that's exactly why they tune in because they like the whole can of worms. They like the, the, what, what you, you got club soda there? Or are you drinking, uh, you drinking Red Bull? No, 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 no. It's a club soda. I've given that up, James. Oh, look at this. Look at that. Look at that puppy. Look at and, that. Well, this is water with lemon and cucumber. Ah, um, I've got eggplant. I've got Brussels sprouts. I've got zucchini, tomato, cucumber, and carrot in there. Look at that. Isn't that beautiful? I mean, I think it's great that you drink them, but I do feel sorry for your wife. <laughs> Russell Sprouts, that's what makes this one really powerful. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, she is one tolerant lady. That's all I can say. <laughs> we have talked about good lifestyle in moderation. In moderation. Drinking liquefied <laughs> Russell Sprouts in the morning is really, that's really going for gold, James. <laughs> Oh man, Jenna, this has been a lot of fun as always. I, I look forward to doing it again really soon. And 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 we're, we're, as we try and fit things into my my new teaching schedule for for summer, which I I'm I'm feeling sorry for my students, but it's gonna be a, it's gonna be a fun. I got a five week stint teaching my my students how to be awesome presenters, and we're doing that. <laughs> what they they all think it's gonna be awesome. They oh this is gonna be a great course, easy to get a great mark. Until they look at the the time schedule, and I always say this to them. I say, um, you know, public speaking is not a hard thing to do. It in fact it's really easy. It just takes practice, and it takes putting into effect a lot of things. That I mean, you know it. It's it, it's just like doing exercise. It's just like doing everything. As soon as you start changing your routine, it feels uncomfortable until you get used to the new routine. And so my students only have five weeks to change the routine that they've been doing for you know 15 years of their lives talking and how they present and things. And it's brutal because I was looking at the, the, the schedule of things and it's every Thursday they have to do a speech for four weeks. And I'm thinking a four minute speech on the way that I want them to do it. That's a lot of work. <laughs> James, don't, don't shout at me, but I, I think you're probably a great teacher, but I, I, I don't think I could cope with you being my professor because you, you've got standards, like serious <laughs> standards. I could never be top of the class or teacher's pet. I, I don't, it's, it'd be hard to be a star at I, the James Piper. You know, you know what? I, I don't, th I, you, you would be okay. You would, cause it, you would, you would give in and you would just start, you would start following my plan. I, I gotta tell you, I got this great story. You're going to love this story. So I had this student who was in my last cohort of public speaking and, and essentially the, the course is public speaking and professional presentations. And I, I lead by example. And I, I say to them, look, from the moment we start, everything I'm doing is what I expect you to do. And I said, so if you just want to get a good mark, just copy me. And I said, don't be me, but you use the same techniques, whether it's gestures, whether it's voice, whether it's organization, all of these things from the moment we start, I'm doing the things I want you to do. And, and I said, look, I, I said, I already do podcasts. We do what, four or five a week, six a week. That's six hours of practicing professional presentation. So I practice the same thing over and over. But so the student comes up to me at the end of the class and she's really quiet, Jenna. It was, you know, one of those really soft voiced girls. And she looks at me and she's in tears. She says, sir, I got to drop your class. And I, I said, oh, really? no. I said, what? And she goes, sir, I just, I can't do it. I said, what you want me to do? And this was sort of week two of a, so in, in, in the regular semester, it'd be a 15 week course. This is week two of 15 weeks of stuff. And, and I'm looking at her, I'm going, really? 
I said, what can't you do? And she goes, well, you know, it's, it's I, I, like yourself, she said, I don't know if I can meet this standard. I don't know if I can actually do this. And I said, I, I don't, I said, I'm not seeing what you're seeing because I think you've got all of the, I mean, after two weeks, you get a sense of who's putting in time and, and who's listening and who's trying and, and, you know, just getting rid of the ums and the yannies. If I can get rid of that in the first week, I, I've succeeded. And she's, she's looking at me, she says, I just, I just don't think I can do it. This girl ended up finishing the class and she did her final speech. And, and yes, it's professional, you know, public speaking, professional presentation. Essentially, it's talk like a Tedster. That's, that's what I'm teaching them to do, to do any kind of presentation, which, which is sort of the underscore of all of my, my class is why isn't every presentation like a TED talk? And they kind of look at me and go, what do you mean? I said, there's great science talks on TED. You know, if you want to actually, the, the my my favorite medical talk. Do you ever watch TED Med, Jenna? No, I didn't even know there was a TED Med. Yes, TED Med is is spectacular. You've got to watch the David Blaine TED Med talk because it is frightening as well as spectacular at the same time. David Blaine, the the illusionist. Yeah, I know. He, he terrifies me, James. I know who he is. You need to watch his talk because it's terrifying. It, it, he basically talks about how he does his illusions. And he's terrifying, this guy. Like, he is absolutely a terrifying dude. <laughs> but it, it's great. with Ted Med, great stuff to watch. Anyway, she, uh, she wanted to drop out. And I said, I, I wouldn't. I'd stick with it. And she ended up finishing the class. She does her, her final speech, which is Ted Worthy speech. And she ends up talking about how about the whole class and how she was going to drop out and what she learned and what she did. And she she was literally a 98, 99 percentile student. She was like, wow. yeah, she did, I think she almost did a perfect score in the class because she just followed everything. And she and and the the, the turning point for most of my students is when they take. So I also talk to them about how to do presentations for classes. And they'll, because every teacher says, okay, you got to do a group presentation. And, I, and I'll say to them, I say, but they don't tell you how to do the presentation. They just say you have to do a presentation. And I said, if they tell you exactly what they want you to do, well, you obviously follow that along, but they never tell you what to do. They just say do a presentation, which means you can do the presentation any way you want, as long as you have certain information. So I, I tell them, this is what I want to see as a professor. I don't care how you get it there, but this is what I want to see. And there's no rule that you can't have a little bit of show and stage theatrics and X, Y, Z involved. And so I've, every semester I get a group of students who say, James, you're full of crap. And they say, I don't believe you. Because they're saying there's no way. There's just, why would no one have ever told us this? And I'm going, because why would we tell you this? It's like, they, they, you know, just do it. And, and so I, I always tell them, take everything I've taught you and now apply it to another class. And they're going, no, I can't work. And I said, no, I'll even, I'll even throw in the bonus. I'll coach you on your presentation for the other class for the rest of your life. Anytime you need some coaching, get in touch with me. I'll coach you on a presentation. Cause I think that's really the way that people learn to present better. It's not just going and taking a class. It's when you actually apply it to something. And so I always get a couple of students who say, James, you're full of crap. I'm going to apply to a class. And if I get a bad grade, it's on you. And every <laughs> single student who takes it follows the, the directions, follows what I say and does it, always comes out. I had one student come up to me and said, sir, I, I got the highest mark in the class. In fact, the professor singled me out as being the best presentation of the semester, following your advice, doing it your way. And everyone else was kind of looking at me going, why is she doing it like this? Why is she doing it like this? And the professor loved it. So, uh, you know, you know, I feel like I'm watching James, you know, those adverts. That an advertorial. And <laughs> Hang up, you get it, and you keep you keep scrolling, but it never gives you what you're looking for until you pay forty nine ninety nine dollars, and then you get the winning formula for James Pikeway's presentation. <laughs> I, I'm, winning formula. Sold. I'm ready to give you my money. <laughs> I'll give you the winning formula. Here it is. Here, here's how you do an excellent presentation. Here it is: introduction and conclusion. You need to have a clear intro and a, near, a clear conclusion. You need to have three clear points with examples in your speech. If, so that's the formula for every talk you're ever going to do in your life. The, uh, so you need to, it's, it's got to be organized and you don't have to organize it as you're putting it together. You don't have to organize it in that order. You can do any of the orders. It doesn't matter. So that's the first thing you need to have. A, you need to have a clear 
pattern to the way you do it and do them all the same way because then you get used to it. And the more you get used to your pattern, the easier it is for you to do a talk on anything because you just follow the pattern that you're used to. Second, second big thing, 90% of what you're doing is, is show. 10% is content. 90% yeah, exactly. of a, a talk is how you're saying it, taking the pause, how you're looking at things, are you using your hands. 90% of it is the show, 10% content, and practice the life out of it. Practice it until it sounds, because I'll do presentations and, and, and I'm like anyone else, I get really nervous. For me, the problem isn't talking, the problem is getting to the talk. So if I have to get up on a stage, I have no problem being on a stage. I love being on a stage. I love a microphone. I love the show. I have trouble getting on to the stage. So I get really, really nervous beforehand. People go, but you, you're good at this. You know it. I even get nervous before I go to my classes. So I have a whole routine that I do because I've, I get just really, really, really nervous about, you know, starting. Once I'm started, A-OK. -okay. Starting, yeah, yeah. big problem. That's that's exactly the same as myself because I love presenting. We're more alike than we keep thinking. And uh, it's like, but, but yeah, same. So as soon, as soon as the first few lines are in, that's it. I feel like I'm free. I'm on stage. It's absolutely wonderful. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't matter what setting that's in. Like you say, even if it's in a small classroom situation, it's, it's, a, it's a show. And even in medicine sometimes, um, I remember a doctor once telling me it's showmanship. A lot of this is showmanship. And you will trust a doctor more, not necessarily on how well they've trained or their knowledge, which is sad sometimes because sometimes the really great doctors don't get recognized as being such because they're not presenters. Mm. But even when you've got your patients, sometimes it's a bit of a show and I, and I love it. So maybe I need to sign up for the class. <laughs> <laughs> next year, it. James. <laughs> yeah, next year. On that note, Jenna, you know what? It has been absolutely spectacular. This has been Doc Talk with Dr. Jenna Burton. We talked, well, we talked about everything. Everything. Oh, <laughs> And, and more. If you want to get in touch with us, Podaholics with a K at gmail.com. We're across the socials, Podaholics with a K, www.podaholics.com. And of course, if you're listening to us, however that is, do leave us a comment, do leave us a rating, and we'd love to hear from you. We'll do it all again real soon. You're listening to Podaholics. This has been Doc Talk with Dr. Jenna Burton. <laughs>